South Asian Symphony Foundation, I welcome you all to this virtual discussion on the topic, Can a South Asian Identity Be Expressed Through Music? My name is Soundri David Rodrigo from Colombo, Sri Lanka, and I have had the honor of working in the capacity of a musician with the South Asian Symphony Foundation. And the foundation has been doing some amazing work in bringing not merely musicians together from the region, but also reaching out to musicians all around the world to come together and use music as a platform to unify the region we call South Asia. The South Asian Symphony Foundation works towards building peace and mutual understanding in South Asia through the medium of music. The founders, Ambassador Rao and her husband, Mr. Sudhakar Rao, in their words were, inspired by the dream that South Asia must overcome, the hesitations of history, and build an architecture of dialogue and cooperation that can nurture and sustain our common humanity and recognize our shared destiny. And as to why they formed the foundation, the why, as they call it, is because the right to music is a fundamental human right and it is compelling that young South Asians must discover the strengths of communicating through music, its nuances and its diversities, and building thus harmony. And this is exactly what it did when the foundation had its first concert of the South Asian Symphony Orchestra called Shirag, a concert beyond borders in Mumbai in 2019. And as someone who experienced playing with a lot of musicians from all around the region, as well as around the world, I must say sincerely that it was an amazing experience to unite together as musicians in an orchestra. This was also the concert that saw the birth of the South Asian Symphony Orchestra. The South Asian Symphony Orchestra held its second concert called Peace Notes, from Gandhi to Beethoven, The Call to Freedom in Bangalore in October 2019. And the person behind this dream, this vision, is none other than Ambassador Nilkuma Rao. I'm sure we need no intro introduction to someone I respect and hold dear to me, Ambassador Rao. Nevertheless, it is my duty to introduce her. Ambassador Rao was Foreign Secretary in the Government of India 2009 to 2011, High Commissioner of India and Sri Lanka and Ambassador to the People's Republic of China. She was Ambassador of India to the United States from 2011 to 2013. On retirement, Mrs. Rao was a fellow at Brown University and also taught there from 2015 to 16. She was a George Ball adjunct professor at Columbia University in fall 2018. In 2019, she was a Pacific Leadership Fellow at UC San Diego. She is a Global Fellow of the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Whilst many may know her for what she's been to her country, what many may not know is that she is a singer with a beautiful voice a voice that touches the soul with the warmth of tone and a lot of depth in what she sings and the sincerity of attention that she pays to detail in terms of the lyrics and the mood of the song. I have personally known her from the day she was High Commissioner uh, for India and Sri Lanka and I used to admire her passion for music. She also established the concert series Beyond Borders where Ambassador Rao together with the accompanies, her accompanies would perform all over India and also I believe a concert in Sri Lanka where she used to bring songs from the region together in which she included in her repertoire. And she is not merely known for the repertoire but she is also known for picking songs that she chooses which has a meaning of an a inspirational message of peace and hope. In fact, her original song, Peace Is My Dream, was also premiered at all concerts because of its strong message. 
So it is that passion that led her with this initiative. And I hope today's dialogue would bring a sense of deeper understanding as South Asians to our own destiny, our own identity, and in doing so, bring us closer to each other and closer to understanding the whole world while embracing our differences. I now hand over this virtual space to Ambassador Nirpama Rao to introduce our panelists. Ambassador Rao. Thank you, Sandri. And let me start by expressing a warm welcome to our panelists here today. TM Krishna, who is in Chennai, Ali Sethi in New York, Ahmed Sarmast in Kabul, Neil Nongkindri in Shillong, and Ravi Bandhu Vidyapati in Colombo. And I also would like to recognize Anushka Fernando Gunatilaka, who is joining us from London and who first suggested we hold this webinar on the theme that asks whether a South Asian identity can be expressed through music. And before I go on, I'd also like to recognize Raghu Tenkayala of the Bangalore International Center, who's helping us with all the technical aspects concerning this webinar and whose presence here today has been immeasurably valuable for us. Music, it has, all, it has been said, has a direct line to the deepest part of what we are. That is a way to make sense of the world. The musician is an integrating figure. He or she can offer us the dream of finding peaceful coexistence among warring factions. That is probably a felt need for us, particularly in our region, this subcontinental space rimmed by the Hindu Kush and the Himalaya and stretching almost 2000 miles to the waters of the Indian Ocean, the geography we call South Asia. How do we rise above differences and disputes to create a practical utopia, you may call it a utopia, built through music? How are we to extract venom and disarm the ideologies of conflict? Do we understand the duties of freedom, of peace, hope, and integration? One recalls Beethoven, who in his great heart embraced all mankind with piercing insight that permeated all falsehood to seek truth, never to betray truth, as he once said, in the manner of a wizard controlling the demons he had invoked. The historian Simon Sharma recently said that the world has built a romance around division. In fact, in South Asia, we have tended to do more than that. We have built divisiveness that destroys any visions of unity we may have. And as one of our panelists, Ali Sethi, told me a few months ago, we have become fixated on difference. So how do we make sense of our identities today? Can our identities as Indians or Pakistanis, Afghans or Sri Lankans, Nepalese, Bangladeshis or Maldivians be expressed through a conjoined expression of the fact that we are all South Asians, homo sapiens of the subcontinental variety, whether from east or west of the region, north or south, can we craft a cosmopolitan, less divergent view of ourselves to see the continuities and the connections? Creating a dialogue across difference, in other words, can music be a code breaker? Can music provide that safe space where we are just human again, conversing, sharing the simple gifts of coexistence? Our panelists today do not need lengthy introductions. T.M. Krishna is a leading Carnatic music vocalist, Max Sese Award winner, writer, and trenchant observer, critic, and commentator, someone who has the courage and the conscience to probingly question aspects of our tradition and our sociologies that we need to better understand if we have to shed our innate prejudices. He navigates this terrain with clarity and purpose and with a grasp of our shared humanity. In his recent Friends in Concert series, he speaks of the concept of Aikya, 
of bringing people together, of building narratives that rise above the all too prevalent divisiveness that we see around us. His latest book, Sebastian and Sons, which a recent reviewer described as as much an attempt to more fully understand Krishna's own location as a privileged practitioner of the divine art of music, as it is a richly documented effort to retrieve the largely nameless, faceless makers of Carnatic music's most distinctive percussion instrument, the Mridangam, from anonymity. So you can understand the wide spectrum of subjects and issues that Krishna addresses and which makes him so unique and sets him apart. Ali Sethi, who hails from Pakistan, is a singer and writer who creates wonderful synergies between classical and popular music and who enjoys a fan following that transcends borders in our region. Music, as he told me a few months ago, helps him to remember lost trails. And the sense I got from talking to him was that here is a young South Asian who I believe understands the pains of partition and the distress of poets like Sadat Hassan Manto, who left Bombay for Lahore and who said, I quote, despite my best efforts, I could not dissociate India from Pakistan and Pakistan from India, unquote. Ali also told me that his recent hit song, Chandni Rath, with its opening line, Chandni Rath Bari Der Ke Baad Aai Hai, or to translate, this moonlit night has come after a very long while, had become a metaphor in his words for endless partitioning, our endless chopping up and saying, this belongs here or there. Ahmed Sarmast, who joins us from Kabul, is the founder of the Afghanistan National Institute of Music, or ANIM, a champion of peace through music and of keeping aloft the spirit of diversity and, uh, and artistic freedom in his country. It is no wonder that his efforts were recognized by the award to him and ANIM of the Polar Prize for Music in 2018, recognized by many as the Music Nobel. This is a matter of pride for all of us South Asians. Dr. Sarmast is an ethnomusicologist. He has vigorously promoted gender diversity at ANIM, and his efforts have led to the creation of Afghanistan's first women orchestra called Zohra, which has played at several international venues. He has always emphasized the importance of music towards establishing a civil society and supporting the recovery of a traumatized nation like Afghanistan. Our South Asian Symphony Orchestra has been deeply privileged to include young Afghan players who have been mentored by Dr. Sarmas in Anu. Neil Nonkin Reed joins us from Shillong. He is the phenomenally talented founder and director of the award-winning Shillong Chamber Choir, composer, arranger, and concert pianist. He's one of the most talented musicians I know, and one who bridges West and East in his compositions. The Shillong Choir has thrilled audiences in India and abroad, singing many of Neil's compositions and arrangements in English and Hindi. He is currently working on a Christmas album, which will be released very shortly, and for, which for the first time will incorporate Middle Eastern influences. He's also working on completing his operatic work, Solingen, which is in the Khasi language of his native state of Meghalaya in India's Northeast. This work will premiere next year. The opera is a tribute to Khasi, a very rich language, and Neil says that Solingen will be the opera for the ordinary man. Ravi Bandhu Vidyapati, who comes to us, to us from Colombo, Sri Lanka, is an acclaimed Sri Lankan drummer, dancer, and choreographer who trained from childhood in traditional Sri Lankan dance forms under the legendary guru Chitrasena, and also at the Kerala Kala Mandalam in India. He has his own dance school, the Ravi Bandhu Samanti Natyatanaya, forgive me if I have pronounced it wrong, with his wife Samanti, 
also a dancer and dance teacher. He has created his own form of short ballet and has choreographed and danced in several critically acclaimed dance pieces which combine both the traditional and contemporary, such as uh, For the Young Killed in War, which explores the theme, explores the theme of the repercussions of Sri Lanka's civil war. His drum ensemble has toured the world and is widely regarded as Sri Lanka's finest drum ensemble. May I now invite our panelists to commence their presentations. I would request them to speak for about eight minutes each, starting with Mr. K.M. Krishna. And after their presentations are over, there will be time for a brief discussion followed by questions and answers. The audience, and I would like to welcome our audience very warmly this evening. Uh, you're requested to ask your questions in the chat box that you will see on your screen. I hope we will have a lively and enlightening session. And at the end of our webinar, Anushka Fernando Gunatilaka will offer concluding remarks and a vote of thanks. Thank you all. Uh, Mr. Krishna, I turn the floor over to you to make your remarks. Please unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Ambassador Rao. Thank you all for uh, giving me this opportunity to have this conversation and a very important conversation that we are having about a South Asian identity, a South Asian musical identity, and probably um, a South Asian cultural identity at some level. Um, I mean, the first question that, that comes to my mind is the creation of identities themselves. Um, how are these identities created? I mean, what is, the, is there a fundamental framework uh, which is the basis to identities being created? So let's maybe look at it I, I think enormously the word culture keeps coming back. Um, what is this idea of culture? And the thing beauty about culture and about most beautiful things then, is that we know it, we feel it, we can smell it, we can taste it, we can even hear it and we see it, but we actually don't know what it is. So when we say our culture or shared culture, it's just, it's an emotion actually. And that's, that's what binds you. So, is there a Southish Asian identity? My instinctive answer is yes, but if you exactly ask me, can you tell me what it is exactly? Um, I may not be able to articulate it in a fashion that is a closed box, that, in, you know, that, that encompasses the entire uh, spectrum of things. Because I think it isn't the color, it's in the design, it is in the melody, it is in the lack of melody maybe too. It is in being in rhythm, being offbeat. I mean, there is this, there is this shared sense of movement, the shared sense of, of how we respond um, culturally in South Asia, uh, musically and through art. That keeps, that binds us. And I think one important aspect, and when I say this, I'm not in any way undermining any other region of the world, is that this region has definitely been welcoming to so much of sound, so many sounds beyond this region. I think that's a very important aspect of what we should call culture, is the fluidity and the welcomeness of receiving. If you look at any art form that we sing, or that, that we may call within quotes traditional for whatever reason, or modern, whatever word you want to use, contemporary, all these words uh, actually have very little meaning in my, my dictionary, but nevertheless, um, all these have been through parallel, through traditional, through uh, receivings that have come from so many different cultures across the globe. And there's been no nitpicking of it. It has it is, it is seamlessly come into the sounds. If you look at Indian ragas, for example, I mean, you could trace these ragas to beyond South Asia. Be, you could go all the way to Iran. The connection between Makam music and the music in India, the connection between the rhythms of Africa and the rhythms of India, the literature, the theorization in India, and Greek theorization in ancient music. So I think in, 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 a, in a most incredible manner, the South Asian identity does not just belong to the countries that represent South Asia. It actually belongs to this, this larger spectrum of the world because we've received so much and we've given and we allowed for giving and receiving in a manner that's, that's quite incredibly beautiful. So I think the South Asian identity is, the, is, is for me an identity of fluidity. 
And it has nothing to do with the political borders that we have created. And culture has nothing to do with political borders. Political borders are just state prisms. That's all they are. Because irrespective of, you know, there's a lovely song um, written by a Tamil poet where he asks, is the wind ever stopped to travel between countries by fences? Does the tree that grows in one side of a border not have its roots on the other side of the border? I think that is actually what the South Asian identity is. That you could trace it to diff all these regions and you could, you could trace the melodies and the rhythms to all these regions. So can we have a South Asian identity? I definitely think we can, but I just want to say it, that itself is not one identity. There's a multiplicity of South Asian identities. So when we discuss a South Asian identity, let's also say we're discussing South Asian identities in plural, because you could have so many different ideas of South Asian identities. And here I think we also need to be very careful because there is also the possibility of every one of these identities becoming monoliths by themselves, becoming the dominant cultures by themselves. I mean, let's be, if I look at Indian music, uh, in most popular conversation, we are going to be talking about within quotes the so-called classical world or Bollywood. That's deeply problematic. So when we say Indian musical identity, we have to say identity. So what are we talking about? We are talking about those that are forgotten to, those that are not heard, those that are appropriated, the names that are lost and the tunes that are lost and the melodies that are lost and the rhythms that are not spoken about are part of this narrative. So it's, I think we need to explore the possibility that we are looking at multiplicity even in these identities. Because if we don't, we fall into another trap of creating one monolithic notion of South Asia. And that's the last thing we do. Uh, we need to do, I think, in a world where especially in today's world, where everybody seems to obsess with creating fences and creating some kind of monoliths. So one important aspect of a South Asian identity is allowing for the contestation of the identity itself, allowing for a questioning of that notion itself from within, from ourselves. So once you do that, then it automatically brings into conversation multiple religions, multiple castes, multiple um, sources, and that, the vibrancy of that, the, you know, what happens, you know, great art happens in that state of flux, and flux is such a, such a beautiful state. And I think that flux is created when there are multiple narratives coming into that flux and asking questions, and asking questions. So when we seek the idea of peace, the idea of peace cannot be sought in some clean slate of happiness. I think the idea of peace is sought in the democraticness of equality, empathy, equity, and creating a level playing field for all these multiple sounds to ask questions and pose different ways of, of coming together. Because I think that's where it is. Because I, you know, we can speak technically about the melodies that, that bind us, or the rhythms that bind us, or the, or the literature that binds us. But I think beyond that, fundamentally, it is, I think, creating this space that will bring us together, creating this environment that will bring us together. And I think in this, there is a great role of artists, of spaces, of people, of how do we create even institutions, because I think we also have to think about how do we create institutions that have this vibrancy, that have this possibility, um, and, and are open to questioning, because the South Asian identity must be an identity that is open to melodic, to rhythmic, to literature, to poetic questioning of itself. And then I think we have something magical truly happening that traverses all the differences that we have. Um, instead of saying celebrating the differences, I would say let the differences play out in a sense of celebration. And I think then we have something special happening here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So eloquently uh, put, and uh, you raised several, I think, very uh, tantalizing, thought provoking questions. Um, particularly about the multiplicities of South Asian identities uh, together, 
cohering into an idea of South Asian identities and allowing these differences to play out and be and to create a sense of celebration out of that, you know, as they say in Sanskrit, that krida, as it were, that play of uh, these uh, different identities. And uh, also, I was very drawn to what you mentioned about the role of artists and how we are able, how we are going to be able to create institutions that that are able to generate a sense of equality, empathy, coming together, creating that space of togetherness. So these were all issues I think that uh, we can discuss further. Uh, and uh, I also like that point you mentioned that culture has nothing to do with fluidity because there is a certain you know, organic uh, flow, a kind of, uh, you know, we call it the chakras in India, that sense that chakras between borders, as it were, is the wind stopping the, the trees uh, from blowing, uh, is, uh, sorry, is the wind being stopped by borders from blowing? or um, trees on one side have roots on the other. I love, love those images. But let me stop here and I'm going to ask Ali, Ali Sethi to, uh, to offer his remarks. Uh, Ali has to leave uh, about, uh, I think it's uh, say about 15 minutes before the end of, the, of uh, our session today. So I'm going to ask him to speak and hopefully he'll be also drawn into our discussion once everybody has made their presentation. Ali, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Rao. Um, thank you, TM Krishna. I'm a big fan and listening to you speak is uh, just kind of, it's a, it's a great boost to one's, uh, you know, belief and, 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 and hope in, in the kind of, you know, effort that we're all involved in here today. I think I would like to uh, kind of address our many themes today by telling the story of my journey in music. I grew up in Lahore in Pakistan, um, listening to uh, a, what now is clear to me was a wide variety of musical genres. I grew up listening to Qawwali. I grew up listening to Ghazal. Um, I grew up listening to, um, you know, the religious, more sort of uh, uh, ritual affiliated genres of Soz, Soz Khani, which would happen in the holy month of Muharram, my mother's family is Shia. And they are, uh, you know, old walled city sort of patrons of the of the rituals of, of bringing out the horse, the zuljana, and the matam, etc. And I would hear and pitch my voice to these um, sort of very Indic, in some ways, um, you know, uh, renditions and reenactments of 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 the carnage at Karbala. Um, uh, I grew up listening also to a lot of uh, pop music. You know, we had Channel V, and we had so we would access Colonial Cousins and you know, we would listen to, and, and thereby, you know, um, because of Channel V and because of Indian movies, et cetera, we had access to what I now realize was, was the larger subcontinental musical, poetic, lyrical tradition. And uh, when I started studying music formally, um, you know, I sang through school and, and sort of uh, did it kind of as a kind of as a kind of passion and then and then became formally apprenticed to an Ustad, Ustad Nasiruddin Sami of the Billy Karana. Um, I had just finished my my liberal arts uh, education, just wrapped up my my four years at college in America and had been singing many of these things without really knowing uh, or without being able to say in any theoretical way to be able to formulate what they were, how they worked. And I think when I sat down with my Ustad, I had this, uh, what now seems to be a kind of uh, arrogant idea about being able, about what learning or studying music might be. I was thinking of it very much inside the, the, the paradigm of, of knowledge production or knowledge absorption, appropriation, and then reproduction. This idea that you study something, uh, you schematize it, you put it inside a framework, and then you are able to work with that. And what I learned very quickly was that not only uh, were the sort of provenances of these ragas and these tals and these concepts of, of ras and bhav and of, 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 the, of the microtone and of the ang of the raga and of the shaksiyat, the personality of the raga and of the timing of the raga, not only were they wildly subjective, um, but also they were coming from often very different places. Um, they were not all, I shall we say, made in the same laboratory. 
uh, they were not made with the same tools. They were not all coming from the same uh, the same sensibility, and that and that the practitioners of this music, the great practitioners of this music, as I learned, were very comfortable with this idea that you know you could have a raga like Nat Narayani, for example, uh, which is made up of Narayani, which comes to us from a Carnatic uh, musical tradition, and Nat, which is the you know the music of the of the Nat uh, performing uh, uh, communities. And, and you could see how, you know, in these hybrid sort of seemingly unstable amalgams, uh, musicians would kind of morph, uh, you know, and reconcile and then, and then part ways. And then within a single raga, within a single bandish, you could see different worlds, different castes, different, different sort of, you know, sensibilities residing without necessarily having to surrender their respective autonomies. That became a kind of recurring theme for me, this idea that, you know, a Kawali can kind of go into a bhajan space and then go into a, a Baghdadi zikr space and then come back into this, this, this space of, of, of kind of, you know, threes and fours and fives and six and the taals can change and the, you know, the rag can exit, you can exit the, the kamaj space and go into a, you know, go into a, a, a sort of bean space and come back into the, and so the effect, the cumulative effect is really only, you can really only, as I think TM Krishna kind of pointed out earlier, you, you can really only articulate it as an emotional experience. You can really only grasp it as an emotional experience. I think codification, schematization, um, any kind of attempt to control uh, these, these artistic strategies uh, and to kind of put them into, into a sort of notational framework uh, was, was impossible. And I, I learned soon enough to surrender that desire. Um, and the moment I surrendered that, the moment I let go of this need to, to control this knowledge, as it were, I think I suddenly uh, began to, uh, I suddenly began to receive it. I began to, I began to dwell in it. Um, and, and, you know, in, in a seemingly minor uh, uh, practices, I would discover whole worlds of, 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 you know, formerly unknown sort of musical practice. For example, uh, my other teacher, Farida Khanum, with whom I have practiced, uh, practiced ghazal and tumri singing and some bandish work. Um, there's this wonderful technique of singing ghazal, which as we know comes to us from, uh, you know, Arabia via Persia, and then really it pretty much vanishes in Arabia. It is not the main sort of genre in Persia, but it remains this kind of, you know, very popular genre of music in South Asia, in, in Afghanistan and in Pakistan and India and, and Bengal and beyond. There's this wonderful musical strategy that, that Faridaji has, which is of, of singing in an R, sort of singing askance, askew, as a kind of, you have a dadra beat, which is apparently, you know, three and six. Um, and then, and yet sometimes you'll hear, you'll hear her singing a phrase in a seven, or you'll hear her singing a phrase in an eight or in a 10. I mean, if you sit down to count it, it seems kind of, uh, you know, extra mathematical, but actually the, what she's doing is it's a kind of, it's a kind of poetic sensibility, which is to elongate, to shorten, to truncate at will, but to do it, as we say in Hindi, Urdu, we say dhang se karna, to do it well is the point. So to, to grow comfortable with, with a kind of improvisational attitude, to grow comfortable with this kind of almost algorithmic um, music, you know, which is at once guidelined and free, which is at once, you know, uh, sort of conforming to something, but also departing from it at all times. To learn to live inside these these paradoxes without encountering them as contradictions, you know, as things that need to be held apart became for me an alternative and a kind of tonic healing <laughs> alternative to uh, the political, social um, uh, sort of uh, world that we live in, especially in South Asia today, where in Pakistan, in India, um, in Afghanistan, we face a lot of political, religious violence. We have people obsessing over, you know, um, everything from 
trying to uh, have linear, tidy genealogies and and sort of narratives about where we come from and, and in the process completely falsifying and doing a real violence to our very supple um, sort of histories. Um, and, and, and yet through music, which happily continues to be a connecting um, a sort of force even in this era where people like myself, I can't go to India, visas are not granted, you know, I'm not allowed, people like me are not allowed to work with any Indian institution. We constantly hear this behind the scenes, oh, we love you here, we would love to have you working with this entity or with this, you know, sort of uh, platform, etc. cetera. And, uh, but we can't officially claim it because there's a lot of pressure, etc. And one is familiar, of course, with this because one is from Pakistan where in the past, one has grown up with so much of this kind of excluding of the other and this policing and patrolling of national boundary and national interest. And yet through music, you know, uh, on a simple Instagram live session or on a YouTube live session, just kind of making a little trail, starting with a ghazal and showing how it connects to a Muhammad Rafi song from, you know, the 1950s, connecting it back to a Tumri from, you know, the 19th century, then going back into a, a bhajan and, it kind of, you know, uh, sets up this this alternative universe in which everybody feels welcome, in which everybody can participate, which allows us to <laughs> simultaneously, you know, it's, just, it's like levitating uh, above these otherwise, these kind of morbid, marshy realities that pull us down every day, you know, back into our narrow, toxic little pools of despair. <laughs> <laughs> um, through music and through lyric, I find so I kind of I've I've grown um, I think I've I've grown I've grown accustomed to kind of working this alternative magic, um, uh, not only for other people but for myself as a way of reminding myself. And now, as somebody who lives in New York City, where again inside the liberal uh, American paradigm, identity is very much a pressing thing, and to be brown is to be you know, inside this, there's black, there's white, there's brown, and then this kind of, you know, again, this music allows me to to really resist any monolithic um, uh, uh, sort of uh, definition of what it means to be in the world. And and I find that South Asian music is really that that soul space that lets me and many others, whether it's me just humming to myself on a train or whether it's me listening to South Asian music or whether it's that kind of extraordinary congregation like sort of mahal atmosphere that is created in a mehfil, in a concert, in a sima, uh, you know, we are here and there and one and many and fundamentally comfortable with those paradoxes, which I think is the quintessential South Asian attitude or sensibility, to be comfortable with paradox, to not have to experience it as a contradiction, to not have to pry it apart and say, you know, this belongs here and this belongs there. And yes, they can come together and still to see it as constituent units. No, we are not those people and we don't need to be those people. And I think this for me is the great South Asian um, sort of strategy for survival, if you will. Thank you, thank you, Ali, and uh, I think you also, in a sense, um, uh, seem to reaffirm what uh, Mr. Krishna uh, mentioned uh, about the sense of hybridness that defines uh, our identities in South Asia. There's no, um, I mean, this this is an amalgam, but we're not being surrounded by our respective autonomies, as you said. So there is that emotional experience, that concept of surrender and uh, very subtle in, in the histories of the arts and cultures that we, that we uh, seek to uphold, and the sense of levitation. I love that concept of levitation. Uh, it seems to be realistically achievable in what we do in music and being comfortable with paradoxes and, uh, and with contradictions. And I'm reminded um, you know, uh, of what um, uh, one of your professors at Harvard, uh, Ali Asani, wrote about in his PhD thesis, he, it was a thesis about the Ginans um, of Gujarat, uh, and uh, the word is based on the Sanskrit jnana, or knowledge and awareness, and the titles, um, you know, like uh, the Bhuj Niranjan, Bhuj is in Gujarat, and the Bhuj Niranjan, 
It's such a Sanskrit sounding, Indic sounding, sounding word, but it's essentially a collection of sacred poetry and bhajans that are used by the Khwaja Ismailis. And you have poems where Imam Ali, for instance, is called Na Kalanki, which means blemishless. And this quality of blemishlessness is also what we use to describe many Hindu deities in India. For instance, with the avatars of Vishnu, for instance, we refer to many of the avatars of Vishnu as the blemishless ones. So in a sense, the people of the subcontinent really embrace these things in a very borderless uh, way. And it's this concept of borderlessness, I think, where this, where ultimately this concept of South Asian identity uh, would, would reside. Now I'd like to, um, before I go to Neil Donkinry, I'd like to invite Dr. Ahmed Sarvas uh, to um, make his remarks. Uh, he was mentioning that the electricity in Kabul tends to go off sometimes without warning, so we're keeping our fingers crossed. We really want to listen to you, so you have the floor. Thank you. Please unmute yourself. Yes. It's a great pleasure to be part of this discussion for me, uh, especially representing Afghanistan, a country which is very uniquely uh, located in South Asia, that during the centuries, uh, it was a recipient, a recipient, but at the same time, played as a, a significant role for transforming other cultural ideas that have been moving towards South, from North, from Central Asia, from Iran, and from the Arab world. So even when we are talking about South Asia and the location of Afghanistan in South Asia, again, due, um, due to this unique location of Afghanistan between South Asia and Central Asia, uh, the, the, sometimes Afghanistan is considered part of South Asia and uh, most of the time part of Central Asia. And that unique position is also put Afghanistan during the centuries to play a significant role in transforming cultural ideas uh, from north to the south and back from south to the north, while at the same time get, get being influenced by those cultural ideas. When we are talking about those shared cultural ideas, it's significantly important that one particular area that can play a significant role in their reunification of the South Asia, it's music. And uh, I, I'm confident that we all know that uh, uh, the musical roots of South Asia, it's a common roots. We can't say that's where that root comes from, but we know that the Vedic tradition played a significant role in the formation of what we are considering today to be South Asian cultural identity, uh, music, uh, philosophy. While I know that at the same time, there are different uh, opinion about this identity or this common uh, heritage. But music was a unifying factor during the century, and it was music that was easily moved from north to the south and from south to the north. And even today, when we are talking about the music of South Asia, I clearly would like to note that, yes, there's variety of type of music in South Asia. We know that the music of South Asia from region to region uh, differentiates. Uh, the music of people is it's one phenomenon that I consider to call it folk music of the people of South Asia, which is diverse, which is very rich. Uh, as the, the diversity of South, South Asia, the musical tradition of South Asia is also very diverse, but there are musical idea, ideas or musical styles that is common for, for the people of South Asia. And these, uh, the, those musics uh, have a very common roots during the history. If we began from the Vedic time and kept moving to today, it was always that musical take and give was continuing between the people of South Asia. And Krishna very the, the appropriately uh, noted in his uh, uh, remarks earlier and also Ali clearly marked that, uh, that uh, diverse, uh, origin or, or roots of musical culture of, of South Asia, that it comes from Central Asia, from India, from Afghanistan, from Iran, from the Arab world. Uh, but again, during the centuries, that, uh, that, that, part, that, that diversity also played in the formation of something that we call a 
common music that is e easily recognizable today as South Asian musical tradition. I'm referring to the classical, uh, to the classical music of the people of South Asia that is played in Afghanistan, it's played in Pakistan, it's played in India, it's played in uh, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. Uh, uh, but that music was formed uh, in the result of the give and take that was taking place for centuries. And again, while today we are, uh, we are living uh, within a particular geographical location, but for the centuries, that geographical uh, uh, boundaries did not exist. The, there was a huge cultural, uh, cultural space in which cultural ideas and musical ide ideas have been moving forward and backward. And also those cultural ideas played a significant role in, the, in bringing peace and unity among the people of uh, South Asia. Uh, a good example, maybe it can be the, the cultural tradition or the cultural love at the court of the Mughals of India, where music and culture played a significant role in the unification of various religion and various people. And music, arts and culture has been used for, uh, for uh, establishing harmony and peace among the people. And today when we are speaking about South Asia, where tension is extremely high, uh, Afghanistan is an example, Pakistan is an example, Co uh, continuous conflict between India and Pakistan, uh, Kashmir issue, uh, the conflict in Afghanistan. But again, it, it, uh, I strongly believe that music can play a significant role in bringing peace, stability, and understanding between the people of South Asia. And I'm very grateful to uh, Ambassador Rao for initiating the South Asia Foundation, the South Asia Symphony Orchestra or Symph Symphony Orchestra Initiative. During the two events that uh, has been organized by the South Asia uh, Symphony Foundation, we could see, we could experience how easily music brings people together, how people through music can live in peace and, uh, peace and harmony without those daily conflict that exist between the people of South Asia. So, uh, to conclude my present uh, that this uh, uh, brief conversation, I would, I, would, uh, I would say that the musical tradition of South Asia, which is or which has been brought or uh, what is the result of take and give between different cultural ideas and musical ide ideas, which played a significant role in the past for keeping the people of South Asia together. Once again, it can be a powerful force in bringing the people of uh, South Asia together while respecting the diversity, which is a beauty of South Asia. So uh, the, uh, while I would uh, advocate for the, uh, for, uh, I would advocate not only to uh, have a common musical, uh, a common identity, but I, I joined Krishna that yes, we can say that uh, while South Asia has so much in common, but at the same time, the beauty of South Asia and South Asian identity is in diversity of identities in South Asia. And those diverse identities within the current, current geographical boundaries, again, it can be expressed through a common musical identity, which is the classical tradition. Today, but when you're playing a khayal or a tumri or a raga in India or in Pakistan or in Bangladesh, or it, it, it is acceptable to, to uh, acceptable understanding and uh, experience and practice by the people of South Asia. The same can be said of Ghazal or the same can be said of Bollywood movies, uh, Bollywood uh, music. They are the South Asian musical identities that regardless of all diverse musical and cultural identities is in a way uh, identical to the people of South Asia and uh, its practice throughout South Asia. So those common musical identities were the, uh, alongside the diversity which, which we should in, uh, embrace, it is a beauty and the source for, the, uh, for a common musical identity of the people of South Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarmas, and uh, very beautifully expressed this concept of uh, celebrating our diversity, respecting it, understanding the histories that have contributed to it, and the linkages uh, to regions beyond. South Asia is not just a hermetically sealed space. There are linkages that we have to different regions of the world, and that is what makes, I think, 
our uh, committee of nations within South Asia sets it apart, sets us apart from many other parts of the world where we celebrate diversity while recognizing the essential unity of what has brought us together because we share a similar geography, uh, migrations and uh, ethnicities, linguistic uh, commonalities, and that really contributes for the unity. But out of that unity, we have cultivated many, many manifestations. It's, uh, you know, the Americans have the, uh, their national motto is out of many, one. But in our case, I think it is out of one, many have been created. In, in also, that sense, that is really what South Asia is and about. And also Thank we you. should not forget, we should not forget our common history Absolutely. from early ages until almost uh, uh, 18th century. Exactly, so, exactly. That's something we should not forget. And that is what we have to create that spe space and that institutional awareness of that common history. Yeah. Uh, now I'd like to go to Neil Nonkindri. Uh, Neil, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being with us to understand how busy you are. Thank you for sparing the time. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, a very good evening to everyone. And I, am, I, I apologize again that I look the way I do because <laughs> I had to do a photo session. I wasn't trying to look the way I do, I don't normally like dressing up like this. But anyway, some some of the things with music you have to do which you don't like, you know, with our profession. Now, um, I'm, I must be honest. A lot of what a lot has been said is is uh, very profound, and I would like to even say that maybe too profound for somebody as me because I actually am a very simple person. But, um, and of course, I just love music. And uh, uh, to tell you a little bit about my background, I, I was obviously, you know, very influenced by Western classical music. But I always found that very disturbing because I came from India you know, and uh, so uh, to cut a long story short, I came back home, found the Shalongji Bukwa, and even in the beginning, we were singing a lot of Western music. Uh, and of course, in today's uh, newspaper, the midday, they quoted me saying that we have had a huge uh, tsunami of American influence in whether it's fast food or music or whatever, and even Christmas. So, so my point, in fact, in fact, this is a, a, an ideal uh, audience to hear my, my journey that I'm going through now. And uh, I would like to first speak about what is happening now, uh, currently. I have created an album, a Christmas album, and usually they're very westernized, you know. Uh, it's always, and, and this is not even Christ centered, you know, it's supposed to be the birth of Christ, but you, you, you hear mommy kissing Santa Claus and, uh, you know, and all this sort of nonsense that we've all, like basically we've been all been told that the, the earth is flat. And now I'm saying, no, the earth is round. Uh, musically, so what happens is that I don't know whether I'm 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 sorry if I'm taking the topic away, but I'm just I'm too simple. I can't explain everything in the sort of language you guys know a lot more. But I'm just telling you a little bit about what's happening. So uh, what's happened is the 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 album, although. It has one thread right throughout. It has the Messiah in it, which is Handel, but uh, done in a slightly upbeat version. But most importantly is that I have included in every song different languages, not just English. So it's a combination. I mean, we've been known for doing these little weave 
weavings of uh, Bollywood and uh, you know other languages uh, with English. And it's the first time for the choir um, that uh, we are doing, for example, we're singing in ancient Arabic. And it was, it was very difficult to find because uh, many, many, many people speak modern Aramaic. Uh, I'm, I'm, when I say many, th there's more of those. And so we have sung, you know, like for example, Silent Night is sung in ancient Aramaic. And, uh, um, you know, for the, the Hallelujah Chorus is done in Hebrew for obvious reasons. And the whole point is that, and, 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 and we the kings, I don't say we three kings, because it, it doesn't say we three kings. We have to research whatever we do. So we three, we the kings is sung in Farsi, you know, Iranian. And it's mixed with, you know, he shall feed his flock. So my my journey for a long time now is to try and like like what we are all trying to do is to be uh, to introduce people to different sounds different cultures and and to do it in such a way that it becomes something that they can digest you know if it's if it's something that i'm not used to hearing and I just suddenly hear something which is too uh, different for me, it might might not be so palatable. So what I've done is, in, in my way of doing it, is I just use this, you know, recall value uh, with using popular carols, but, you know, they sung in Farsi and uh, uh, even uh, modern Aramaic also. And I have used a lot of alabs, um, and you wouldn't even think it's a Christmas album if you hear it because it sounds so Eastern and and it's, it's trying to promote, although it's not, you know, uh, predominantly South Asian, but it's more, more like what we are talking about, you know. And for those who are from, from Afghanistan, let me tell you, I'm really lucky because four of my members have, you know, have their roots in Afghanistan. Uh, I have three boys who sing the choir and they they come from Afghanistan. And uh, so I'm very happy for that. And then uh, we have a very, you know, mixed group. Some have got Nepalese blood. Some have got, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, some have got uh, uh, Chinese blood. And uh, so the choir, in in itself has represented this this kind of diversity, but at the same time a very um, a very strong cohesive uh, attitude that we've had together. So all I can say is that that's what I'm doing now, and then hopefully with my opera, it will be. Um, uh, yeah, you know, uh, you know, like you know, we have this expression. Can the the main theme today is can South Asian uh, identity be expressed through music? Of course, that's what I'm doing. I'm touching on different subjects in different ways, and in fact, the opera that I'm making is very well. It's trilingual. It's not even one language. It's I use Khasi as the language. But we've included other languages, and in and in, in my uh, album now we've used you know Urdu, we've used all of this, and I think it it and if you have that uh, you know the the sort of craft, you can weave it together so that it can sound very very. Um, there, there can be a certain weaving together as if it's one piece rather than, you know, separate the East from the West. And uh, so my, my point is, yes, we can have our, our own identity, but at this junction, it is, it is like, I think like many people have said, it is also to be, um, you know, uh, using 
a sort of more global approach at the same time. Because I feel that uh, whether it's food or whatever, you know, cultures is becoming more global. So, um, so I come from that kind of um, viewpoint and that we don't segregate because we have enough of that. And I don't know whether I've understood it wrongly, forgive me, but you know, I, I just say this and, uh, uh, and I think that's all I have to say. And I just, uh, uh, and, and, and the, the other thing is um, when I came back, I was very disturbed about just playing Mozart and Beethoven and all of that, because I said, that's, that's not me. And there was a part of me because I, I, I mean, I might look a little bit fair, but I'm predominantly an Eastern person. So I just love the tabla. I just love the alabs. I love, you know, Pakistani music. I love all of that, you know, and, uh, and, and I hate all this snobbery that, you know, the ultimate music is Wagner. Who says that, you know? I mean, some of the greatest musics I, I've, I've heard has been on Coke Studio. I've heard these Pakistani singers who sing better than so-called trained opera singers. So I'm, 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 I'm a great one for con controversy, but I'm trying to spare you because I think I'm going to get into a lot of trouble at the moment because I, I'm, I've got a whole lineup of interviews and hopefully I don't say the wrong things, but I just like to speak the truth out so that we don't have this hierarchy. I mean, I'm so sorry to say, my album is tackling even racism. You know, we have been so um, obsessed even to date about the white, you know, it's always, you know, it's ruled by this sense of, you know, there's nothing greater than Western classical music. Who says it? I don't want to listen to Schoenberg. It, it gives me a, a headache, you know, and most of them who say they like it are pretending. And then, um, but you give me a lovely melody from, uh, let's say, you know, uh, Sri Lanka or what, whatever, you know, music is music. And it doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't have to be anything. Music is an expression. And I always say, uh, because for me, I believe a lot in the divine. Um, it's, I said, you know, you can get the best instruments made by a human being, but you can't, you cannot be that which God himself created, which is the human voice. So, um, I, 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 I am a great believer that yes, we should we should push for the for the identity only because it has been too overwhelmed <laughs> by by you know uh, like like you look at Christmas you know it's too overwhelmed by the Western world which is not fair we are not looking at the Mediterranean or the Middle Eastern story so from that point of view. Yes, we have to get our identity. It has to be expressed, but um, but not at the point where it creates, you know, a division and you know that sort of thing. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, thank you so much, Neil, and thank you for again celebrating this idea of diversity and for speaking out so candidly and frankly and truthfully and being what you are, being what you stand for. And really some, I admire the values that you've expressed. And um, you expressed the need for this uh, sense of cosmopolitanism within our region, not to look inwards, but to also be able to look outwards, not to be beholden to just one stream of tradition or music or, or you know, a genre. The ability to assimilate, and I think that is what has set South Asia apart all these centuries. We were able to assimilate, we were yeah. able to adapt, we were able to incorporate so much into our own mainstream. And that is what we need to do continuously. And what you're doing, for instance, with your Christmas album, when you talk of 
you know, bringing in the languages, ancient Arabic, ancient Aramaic, and uh, having a sound and a flavor that is different from the Western conception of what Christmas uh, should be like. And, you know, uh, and we're really looking forward to this album, Neil, and uh, I can't uh, wait to hear it. And thank you so much for expressing your views, uh, as I said, so truthfully and candidly. You will not get into trouble for them. No, nobody, everybody will appreciate that candor. And that truth. And I hope people understand the need for that kind of truth and candor. We need it. I'll just tell you something very funny today. Some stupid, cheap uh, news agency uh, got a recording of my uh, uh, interview with Midday. And he just put it in one of these machines that translates the audio voice. And I actually said in my interview, I hate snobbery. Okay. I love the opera, but I hate the snobbery part of it. So I said, I hate snobbery. And guess what they wrote there? Neil Nonkandri, Neil Nonkandri loves snobbery. This is the price you pay for being known or whatever. And what, and then... My the title of my my Christmas album for, for I won't go into it is called uh, Come Home Christmas, uh, because we're living in a pandemic and and whatever and it's it's got different layers of meaning in it, but then you know what they they when I said they changed the name of my album to Come Home to the Residents. <laughs> Because for me, a home is different to a house or a palace or whatever. A home is people, it's the hearts, it's the, it's the singing together. And it's the, the joy of, you know, sharing one another's hearts. Absolutely, absolutely. Especially at this time during the pandemic when, you know, being thrown into such a different, such a, such a, such a threatening world as it were. And I think BBC is going to, I mean, I was on the BBC, you know, for for um, uh, sort of program, they played some of my music. I think they, if, if they play it again, especially on BBC Two, I'm, I'm going to get into trouble because, I mean, some will like it, but I, I just don't care because if I like it, I mean, I don't care. I mean, if I like it, that's, that's, that's my measuring goal. And... Um, and then uh, what, what I've done is, you should hear what I've done with the, the, the Messiah. I mean, it almost doesn't sound like the Messiah. It sounds like some Middle Eastern piece because you hear the language, it's in Aramic and it's got drum beats. And I've used, I've purposely used uh, not just, uh, you know, uh, rhythms or, uh, that are uh, Middle Eastern but I've also used uh, the instruments that are, you know, but in, but you, you will always, you will also hear the first Viennese school in me because that's where I was trained. So uh, you will always hear the orchestra, they, they will always be a little bit of the, you know, uh, the orchestra there. So it's this whole combination of thing. And so far, I think it's working. And uh, I just got the news just now because we weren't, we weren't, uh, we were wondering who's going to, um, you know, uh, take over. So we just got the news that uh, Sony is now my, uh, oh. who are going to release it. Congratulations! That's wonderful news. I'm glad uh, you could uh, announce it on this platform. That's wonderful. Yeah. In fact, the first people to for me to announce it. That's why I'm saying it, not to sound pompous, but I just feel that I really appreciate all of you because you know you some of you are living in very difficult territories, and that's why I came into this when I heard the word Afghanistan, for example. Um, I I I actually I I tell you honestly. I said no to a one-to-one -one with Hillary Clinton, but I said yes to this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. <laughs> it's just, it's you, God bless you. I mean, I know, I mean, you know, it, but it's not my cup of tea. I mean, it, it, I, I, I'm a different person. I, I just don't, I, I don't, uh, I don't go for all this 
other things. That's right. We'll That's right. But okay. the, the other thing is that uh, we are also uh, with the, for example, I'll give you a little example which I have done. I don't know what other operas have done, um, but of course it, it is based on a folk tale. And, um, and when this uh, prince comes back, the, 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 the chorus is actually done in about four languages because there are different people in that, that, uh, that scene. So you hear Hindi and you hear uh, Kasi and you hear the English because in the 1800s, it's set in 1865. So you hear the Britishers, you know, all, you know, finding this guy so handsome and whatever, you know. And uh, so it's, it's, it's going to be a very, very um, interesting, hopefully in interesting opera because it will show uh, both the localized uh, pros and cons that we have as a society, but also that even those who are not from this region will identify with it, you know. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Neil. I hope I have, you know, I can talk a lot, you know, and I just hope I don't. We will come back to you if you if you can stay with us a little while. I'm going to request yes. Mr. Ravi Bandhu Vidyapati to uh, to make his presentation. Okay. Uh, and then we can discuss. Can speak a little bit more if you want one or two more questions because I have another meeting after this. Yes. Uh, well, uh, I think. Uh, we're looking forward to the opera, Neil. I, I've listened to some of the some of the excerpts from it over the years, and you remember how I've always been a great cheerleader for for your Kasi opera. So I'm really looking forward to seeing it come on stage, and I believe it'll uh, be ready by next year, isn't it? It is actually almost ready. It's, it's just a, because of the pandemic, you know. And of course, my manager was going to be um, uh, what's his name. Uh, Doc Sheldon, you know, who who's like, you know, the head of Sony, uh, no, head of yes. Universal Columbia. Columbia. So he had come to Delhi to listen to the opera, so he was very keen to, to take it. But then the pandemic kept, happened, and then um, uh, and then he was going to take it all over. Um, but then uh, now we'll have to wait. I might have to do a film version of it first. And then uh, at least people can still have to reach out. And then, um, and then there's a, a huge amount there that is, is not just my dialect. There's a lot of, you know, tabla. Tabla is something that I just love. And I wrote a piece for Zakir Hussein and um, the Israeli Philharmonic, uh, you know, for Zubin Mehta's 80th birthday. And he actually liked it, which is quite nice for me, you know, because having Zubin Mehta uh, exactly. was, and, and the Israeli uh, Philharmonic absolutely loved it. So, and it just shows you that, you know, we have to find a way. And uh, even Amjad Ali Khan, uh, Ustad Amjad Ali Khan said, you know, please write something for me. And there are lots of interest uh, in the in in even major artists that they want to 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 combine they want the music to be heard not only in their camp but i think if we mix we have this inter integration there will be a lot more people listening i mean people were we did the festival at the uh, the raymond's uh, you know jepu music festival and and people were just you know loving the fact that I did this entire dance sequence yes, with yes. The feet and and the tabla. And I'm going to just come back to you, Neil, because I think Ravi Ravi Bandhu is waiting to speak. So okay, sorry, in I'm the sorry, interest sorry. of time, I think we will have to ask him to speak. And I know, I can't the I can't Thank you, thank you, Neil. Thank you. God bless you. Mr. Ravi Bandhu, please. Well, uh, thank you all, uh, and especially Ambassador Rao and uh, Soundri for inviting and giving me the opportunity to uh, be part of this 
discussion. Uh, well, I must confess that I'm not much of a speaker. Therefore, I have written down what I have to say. But to begin with, um, coming from Sri Lanka, a melting pot of many cultures, I've been a great receiver from the day I was born. In my in my culture, has my culture has given me the opportunity and the practice to receive from all over Sri Lanka, situated in the you know just beneath this the the southern tip of sri lanka um you know through the trade winds from the west and the silk route we have received so many things and it has become a real melting pot of many cultures musical disciplines dances languages and so on therefore <clears throat> i basically endorse the ideas that uh, Krishna and Ali and Dr. Ahmad uh, uh, mentioned of South Asian identities of in multiplicity and celebrating the same in equal feeling of welcome and reception. So um, <clears throat> let me now read this out to you. Pardon me if this sounds too formal. Uh, music is a primary and essential art like dancing. When man discovered and developed ways to express himself with movements, it happened with sound. All physical movements uh, of the universe are associated with sound. So the human movement was always accompanied by sound sound that emanated from the throat through voice each individual has his or her own voice voice quality and voice range that is identical thus the idea of identity was established in the beginning itself so from individuals to communities societies to civilizations and cultures identity became a phenomenon that is associated with all human activities but identity as we use it today has come to play certain political connotations as well today we want identity our, we, we want our identities to indicate our power, dignity and superiority over others. On the other hand, the word identity also creates certain semantic perplexities. The word identity derives from the Latin root idem, which means the same or not changing. But civilizations cultures the arts and traditions within those cultures and the forms and styles and techniques within those arts are constantly evolving and changing entities and evolve they must if they are to survive and live that is the law of nature and the process of evolution is always one of give and take, assimilation or integration. We know that uh, neighboring geographical regions have similar cultural expressions. The last geographical uh, separation of earth plates has taken place some 7,500 years ago. Though we were geographically separated, our cultural roots were not. That is why Sri Lanka shares many cultural similarities, commonalities with that of South India. Let me, let me give a very small example here. Uh, Kumiyadi, the South Indian dance, uh, Krishna. Pardon me if, may, if I make any mistakes in singing this little thing. It may be wrong. But which goes like this. 
Kumi adi adi kumi adi adi kumi adi adi kumi adi da 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 la 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 da 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 Now, can I join you? Oh, great! Okay, the same the same tune. This is a very famous tune. Subramani Bharati, a very famous poet. Yes. Sindhamirnadenum podi nile in vatin vandu payid kadi nile. Engal tanda yer naden rape chinile vur shakti pirak dumu chinile. Just to tell you that. Ah, Eva. So that listen to this very traditional Sinhala dance, Sri Lankan dance song. That of course in a different uh, time signature. Ta 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 na ta ne na ta 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 na ta ne na ta 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 na ta ne na na. Or uh, another tune. Uh, Tana Tani Ne Tana. Of course, Soundary and I have uh, played this together so many times. Uh, so they are the same notes. Sa pa da pa ma da pa ma ga re sa ni sa re ga ma ga re ga re sa. But it's the well. It's the it's the it's the expression. It's the application that makes the identities. The roots are the same. The roots of Sri Lankan traditional music can be traced in our ancient dance ritual chants and folk songs. Major part of the ritual music consists of complex drum rhythms and chants that are associated with the dance. Beside, we have a classical court music tradition that came down with the South Indian princesses who were married to our kings. So, a natural integration of what filtered down from South India and our own indigenous music has paved way for our mainstream traditional music of today. There is also another strong and long-standing musical tradition associated with Buddhist temples. Yet another stream is what we have assimilated from the Portuguese, such as Baila and Cafarinha. So, uh, considering all those things, I think we really cannot talk about this identity as one single entity because there are so many identities that have come together. In traditional music, the identities are incorporated, preserved and therefore can be easily recognized too. So we do not have to deliberate on the expression of an identity. Where then we need to express our identities? I think it is in the new music, modern music or to put it uh, in put it in put it broadly creative music that we need to deliberate on our identities because in creative music we tend to transcend boundaries and explore new areas i'd like to quote rabindranath tagore in this context when he says um, it is a sign of great geniuses a sign of great genius is his enormous capacity to burrow, most often without knowing of it. He has unlimited credit in the world market of cultures. It is the mediocre who is afraid and ashamed of burrowing, for he doesn't know how to pay it back in his own coin. So in other words, what is borrowed must be turned into one's own. Um, for example, many of us use Western classical music techniques to enrich our modern music. On the other hand, we also freely borrow from our traditional roots its many elements as tools in order to express identity in our new compositions. What must be remembered here is that we must pay total respect to the traditional sources that we touch and treat them carefully, respectfully and not as mere tools. It is important that we build our new compositional structures 
on traditional frameworks so the world recognizes and identifies it as coming from a different cultural region. Thus, a cultural diversity is preserved against a speedy globalization, not forgetting that globalization is also an inevitable process. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ravimandu. Again, we come back to the concept of diversity. Uh, yes, the very important aspect of globalization, keeping one's windows open. You quoted Tagore and this ability to borrow from this uh, uh, world market of culture, the enormous credit that you that genius has in the world market of culture. I think uh, what Neil, the work Neil is doing is very much, I think, expressive of that also. But uh, fascinating and I loved to hear you and uh, Krishnaji sing and uh, you know it's it kind of uh, gives you goosebumps to understand the way we are all connected across borders you know the roots in one part of the region the tree grows in another I think um, it's fascinating to hear that and uh, I think since we've, uh, uh, we've had all our speakers uh, make their presentations, um, you know, I, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Krishna, do you have any comments to make on what you heard, uh, you know, the presentations that you heard? And just now you heard uh, Ravi speak about uh, Sri Lanka and uh, the linkages with South India. Uh, would you like to say something? Yeah, just a few things. Uh... Um, and in fact, if I'm sorry to interrupt, there was a question from one of our audience members, uh, in fact from uh, Pratiti Balal, who is a, a friend uh, who lives in Bangalore, and she asked, could you speak about the sociality of music, friendship, uh, which is the theme of your recent concert, concerts? And uh, Neil, this uh, should, should interest you, the beginnings of chamber music in Europe, or for that matter, Friends hanging out and making music. What what really can um, can we borrow from these concepts to build uh, the idea of an identity? These ideas of identity. Uh, let me say on the basis of what we've all spoken about, the ideas of identities, not just one identity. So um, you want me to address the question first? Yes, please. Yeah. So I think um, you know. I think there's a lot to, I think, uh, develop on the idea of friendship because friendship is where art begins. And friendship, friendship is a larger idea of being together and sharing. Friendship is about sharing. And I think sharing is one of those things where there is no giver and a taker. It, there's no transaction there. Uh, it's mutual. I mean, uh, so I think, I think we need to build a larger idea of friendship because the fact is that the friendships we have are also limited. Let's let's kind of introspect about it. Our friendships are limited by our circle, by our cultural environment, by our exposure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think we also need to make an effort, and it has. And this is not going to happen automatically. Let's not just think that we can have this discussion and feel good about ourselves, and it's going to happen. No, there has to be an intention to break free from the limitations of friendship itself. Um, so I think that's the beauty of what we what we need to do is so when we say we're making friendships we are tapping upon the possible linkages we are tapping upon the connections but we are also recognizing that an effort needs to be made for that to happen because natural osmosis happens but unless there is societal effort uh, it becomes it can be problematic at different levels so that's one thing I want to say because I think it, the source is friendship and about tapping that within ourselves and within the way we look at the world. The two things I want to say uh, is, you know, I think there's another question that interests me is when we say South Asian identity, South Asian music, the question is, who's listening? Are we asking that question too? Uh, because there are multiple ideas of listeners. I will tell you the music I sing is noise to a person who lives two streets away from where I live. And the music, to, what, which is music to that person's ears, is noise to me. So it, this whole binary, I, I'm placing the binary very, very purposely of saying noise and music. And I want to just give you an anecdote. I say this many times and I want to give this anecdote. Is in one of the um, collaborations that uh, I have been involved in, 
it was with this art form called kute. Some people call it terakute, they call it kate kute. And they have a musical tradition. The first time I ever heard it, it was noise to me. Let me just very clearly say it. They were not in pitch, it was not music, it was noisy. It belongs to my state, they sing in my language. Uh, I understand every story they were telling, but the sound was noise. And I love those people too, so there's friendship, right? Uh, working with them, you know, learning to, shall we say, dive deep into a different cultural idea, different aesthetic notion. I, I get goosebumps talking about it today because suddenly one day, to the same years, that's my years, it became music. Now, how did that happen? What, what really happened for that transition of something that was in Hindi, Besur, to become Sur? So, you know, for a lot of North Indian um, listening people, Carnatic music sounds out of pitch. So even the notion of something being in pitch, for example, people who are used to Western classical music, a lot of Indian tones is out of pitch. So this notion of pitch itself is diverse. The notion of singing in tune is diverse. Isn't that so fascinating? You know, we think that everybody understands singing in tune. No. Singing in tune is a diverse idea. So when I hear a song coming from two streets away from my home, which is in a form that I am alien to, it's up to me to embrace a different cultural aesthetic before I even experience it. So can we debaggage ourselves is the question that we are asking. And then the diversity of not just the music, but the diversity in listeners, in the listening, is also something that I think we should think about. And I want to say one last point, and I don't want to, I don't want to hog too much of the time, is something about, about cinema music. You know, it's a fascinating genre because it doesn't have one singular form. That's its greatest asset, is that it's completely dependent on the storyteller, dependent on the story, dependent on so many things. And so if you look at, you want to call it, you know, now we have Hollywood, Bollywood, all the woods around town in India, but whatever wood it is, but the fact is, it's one of those things that can embrace so many ideas and identities without calling it out. And I think in spite of all, you know, I may have critical points to say about it, I think this is, that is something to learn for all of us from that idea, from that conceptual idea that, of course, it's an aesthetic form that it, it embodies and hence it's like that. But isn't it fascinating that Bollywood can very, very organically, because of the story being the basis, have so many sounds, smudge so many borders in a way that many other forms cannot do with that freedom. So I think, uh, you know, I think there's something to, to tap into there, something <laughs> to, to respect and not think of it just as popular music that everybody loves to listen to. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, Neil, we have a question from one uh, of uh, the attendees, uh, Ankna Arokia. Uh, here is my question for Mr. Neil. Could you share your thoughts and experience on what it is like to pursue Western classical music in India? Is it possible that this genre isn't the other and could belong to everyone who wants to engage with it? I love that you have made it a part of your own identity. Uh, what do you have to say about that, Neil? Well, like I said, you know, I did love, obviously, I did love Western classical music because I grew up in a home that listened to it. You're, you're formed by your, uh, whether you like it or not, we are all formed by our uh, surroundings and our upbringing, but it always disturbed me that uh, you know just playing Western music and all of that. Uh, I know Lang Lang does it, and you know all these other people do it. But for me, I I had a great need to promote the the East inside of me, and of course it started with my own language, and then it's that it went to Hindi. And of course, not everybody is that great a fan of mine with my mixture of Bollywood and, uh, and English. But I just did it, you know. And one minute I'm writing an opera and the next minute I'm doing all these so-called, you know, you know, for some, some of these elitist, you know, cheap music, you know. 
But for me, there's no cheap music. Music is music. It's 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 it can be sung by a child, and 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 sometimes a child can sing so out of tune. But the purity that the child sings it is what you should listen for. So I would say um, when I came back, um, I did start to explore. I said, right, okay. Handel's Messiah has been done, you know, a thousand times. And, you know, all these Beethoven so, uh, uh, sonatas have been played. Now, what am I going to contribute to this world? And then suddenly I realized I have this wonderful advantage of knowing both the worlds. So I know my own traditional folk music. I know a little bit. And then I started to, to get a, a lot of interest. And I actually got taught by a tabla player my, myself to, to help me write, you know, um, more, more uh, Eastern music. And I use a lot of dholaks now. I'm, I'm really, that's my new love. And, uh, and you'll hear that in the album. So it's been, a, uh, so I have not left, I have not thrown the baby with the bathwater, as you say. I have still kept my traditionals uh, uh, form of writing. I still write my music. I don't do it by ear and that as such because I, I, I am quite, you know, uh, systematic in that way. But within that, like somebody said today, within that system, you take that fluidity, that freedom that you can get from some, let's say, a Sufi singer. That's why, you know, if you see the opening of We Three Kings or We the Kings, you'll hear this guy singing Alab uh, in Urdu. And I never wrote it. I just said, just sing whatever's in you, you know. So there's this combination of the formal and the the the, the voice of the informal or the heart. So right. that that has been a great journey, and I I love this 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 sort of writing now, and uh, and 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 it, and I think in 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 doing this, we are going to preserve some of our, our identity because it will take us to an audience that would have never listened to us in the first place, or vice versa, you know. So to unite it together. And then, you know, and of course, my next album is going to be totally Hindi. You know, there's not going to be any English in it. And it's going to be all the old songs from Sari Gama. So my next uh, album is with Sari Gama. So I'm taking all the songs from, uh, I remember, ma'am, you're the one who said, sing Dil Tarap Tarap. And I said, no, no way. But that's got my, you know, I put more views on that than most songs. So you're a very good, you're a very good uh, uh, judge of uh, what what sells. <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, but you know, thanks to you, and I want to thank you especially and Soundry. Soundry is a person I will never forget. You know, I am where I am, Soundry, because you believed in me. When I was just a very, very, um, uh, you know, uh, uneducated person who came to Sri Lanka, and you just loved us, and and uh, and a ma'am Nirupam Rao, just your love over the all these years. So I would like to just say that, and of course the rest of you, I don't know you, but uh, I'm I'm glad to hear a lot. A lot of your your talk, though I must admit that I'm a very simple guy. So um, uh, I, I I appreciate what you say and the complexity in which you can speak. And I do wish I can go towards that more and more as I write. So God Thank bless you. everyone. I have to do now. So may God bless everyone and in your pursuits and. And like we always say, and I mean it with all my heart, stay safe. Uh, you know, wherever we are, stay safe. And, you know, just God bless. Thank, Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for allowing Thank me to be part of it. And I have a last question before we wind up. And this is perhaps our last, Dr. Sarmas and Ravi Mandu. Uh, 
This is a question from Priyanka Venkatesh, who has performed with our orchestra. She's speaking from LA, Los Angeles. And she says, while I've experienced and performed many, many informed and intelligent intercultural compositions, which I love, orchestra compositions which evoke South Asia often dilute, uh, sorry, let me get this. Where is the question? Often dilute, computers playing some trick, often dilute South Asian traditions, taking tonal material of say a raga without delving into the deeper aspects of the raga. South Asian traditions often end up becoming a melodic decoration in the larger harmonic architecture of the Western orchestra. Uh, any of the panelists can take it, even uh, Mr. T.M. Krishna perhaps would like to speak about it. Uh, uh, we would, I would request you to keep your answer short and then uh, we will wind up because I know we've kept you for quite long. So uh, please bear with us. So essentially, uh, South Asian uh, ragas and material which are used in Western orchestral performances often end up becoming melodic decorations in the larger harmonic architecture of the orchestra. Why is that? And how can you know, we address this dilemma? Any of you? Anybody? Well, well uh, uh, because I have to go, I'll just say one line. Like I said earlier on, when I when I did, uh, in fact, three of my songs have got alabs in the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. And I have not allowed it to be tonal, or I have, they, I've given the the singer just the, the the sort of the chord. And I made sure the chord is because we in 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 Eastern music we are much more into the minor, you know. We have more angst. Maybe we have more sorrow than the West. I don't know. Well, it doesn't look like it uh, now in America. But anyway, uh, but uh, the thing is, I, I would give a, a chord that would suit. Would you have to be? You have to be. Uh, you have to empathize. You can't give a tonal, you know, classical chord and ask somebody to sing an uh, an alab or something that is very traditional to them. So when I've done it, and I hope when you hear it, you, you, when you hear the opening of We Three Kings, you'll almost think it's a Mediterranean piece, you know? So that's my take on it. And, uh, and uh, other people might have different ways of doing it. And, uh, and, and, and I think if you combine some, both of it, it won't, it doesn't matter. Sometimes it's also nice to hear it done in a different way you know this is like you like with silent night i've done the opposite i've taken the tune of silent night which is normally in a major key and it sounds like and it's in aramic and it's in in a minor key and it sounds like uh uh you know an eastern piece so i think we can do both yes absolutely dr sarmas would you have anything to add Uh, do unmute yourself. I would like to note here it depends who composes and who, uh, which structure you used for using uh, a South Asian or a classical concept for Western music. Because in Western music, there's particular structures that does not allow you, and you have to operate within that, within that structure. While in uh, Classical music in the South Asia, the, what, there, there is a structure of bandage, but there's a lot of freedom for creativity and improvisation. When you uh, ignoring that creativity, uh, the, 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 the creativity and improvisation, that's gonna lead you to that framework that's uh, eventually the tradition or the uh, aspects of, uh, classical music from South Asia turns into decorative melodic lines and so on. It's connected to the structure of Western music and also, uh, I assume, by ignoring the principle of creativity and improvisation. Okay. Uh, 
Ravi, would you like to say anything? Do unmute yourself. Uh, unmute. Yeah, I think it's mainly on the part of the listener uh, that uh, must be considered because uh, when one attempts on a kind of a meeting of two musical disciplines or cultures, it is not expected to be uh, the 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 original the to bring out the originality of say the uh, the question was when. Uh, Eastern classical music or South Asian music is played with Western orchestration. Uh, it doesn't really sound, it doesn't really bring out the nuances, a sense of the South Asian uh, music. Well, it, it's something that is inevitable and something that cannot be avoided because by bringing together to things like that we we know that we are going to put us put put our music in an alien structure so western classical music is all highly structured and the the uh, the slide the the uh, very very uh, different light nuances of our singing or playing an instrument cannot be brought into that kind of uh, framework of a highly structured discipline of music. Now, I faced this problem when I created uh, a piece uh, for, for a hundred uh, member orchestra invited by Sri Lanka Symphony Orchestra. Uh, when they had a combined orchestra with uh, the China National Symphony Orchestra and the Sri Lanka Symphony, they commissioned a piece from me uh, uh, a piece for traditional drums and orchestra. So I based the entire piece on a traditional set of tunes, which is called Kuenyasna tune, again a dance tune. But just see how when I sing it in the traditional manner, how it goes with all the frills and these things. For example, Apage Muni Raja So all these little frills, the murkis, <coughs> but when I arranged the entire thing to the orchestra, for the orchestra, I just took the main melodic structure only, knowing that I'm doing that, which went like this. La 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 So one knows what one is doing, and then it is also the duty of the audience to understand what has been uh, done or uh, what has been presented and take it as it is. That's true. That's very well said. Before I uh, ask Mr. Krishna to say a few last words, I wanted to mention, uh, Ravi Bandhu, that Marielina Fernandez, who is also an old friend of the Foundation in Vienna, Austria, says she loved the word mentioned by you, stressing the joy of receiving. Most of us want to make music, but the joy of responding, uh, which lies with the audience, with the listener, with you know those who come, who congregate, who come to listen, I think we have to measure that also, the joy that we give, just as much as, as you mentioned, this process of give and take is all about. So thank you so much. And Mr. Krishna, I'm going to ask you to have the last word, and then uh, I'll ask uh, Anushka to sum up, and we'll say good night. I'm not exactly sure what I'm supposed to say, but thank you very much. Uh, this has been, I think, a wonderful conversation. And um, there's one question I just want to just address about the colonial uh, past of this part of the world. Uh, I think it's important to also embrace that as being part of our cultural self. 
So when we use words like tradition, I do believe the colonial past, and it is messy. I mean, it is complicated. It is it it is disturbing. Uh, it it has its thing. But I think I think you know. Let's not think of music as being creaseless. You know, in fact, the beauty of music is ha- that there are creases. And uh, you know, somebody asked a question about it, which which uh, Ravi quite beautifully answered actually about you know uh, say the the honesty of raga not being there when presented in it. You know. Uh, one is, of course, the intentionality of the person working. If the person does not have uh, intentionality to create a conversation between the two, it's not going to happen. And that's true of the reverse, too. Let me also say that. Like when you have Indian music presented with absolutely superficial understanding of harmony, for example, it's, it's as, as much problematic. But there's also something. Everything need not fit in like a hand in a glove. You know? Some things can remain different, but isn't that also a beautiful thing? to have two things that don't necessarily hug and kiss but on the same stage you know so i think i think you know in all the conversations we are having it is about this possibility of of multiple conversations multiple tunes and sounds and histories and 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 parallel movements coming together sometimes singing the same tune sometimes not singing the same tune but i think the important thing is respect if we can create music multiple music with respect um, i think then we have we have something quite beautiful happening in south asia thank you and this so beautifully summed up respect and responsiveness and uh, just celebrating our numerous identities so we have this plurality that we are left with and that is really what we need to celebrate i want I'm going to ask Anushka to sum up, but let me add a personal note of thanks to Mr. Krishna, uh, to Dr. Sarmas, to Neil. Adi Sethi had to leave a little early because he had another interview, and uh, to Ravi Bandhu. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, most sincerely, for your participation today and for the enormously relevant statements and remarks that you've had to make. Uh, you've, had, you've made and you weighed in on a very important topic, and I hope you'll be able be able to continue this discussion further in the future. Thank you. And Anushka, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's been an absolute feast, in my opinion, um, the diversity of thoughts, of discussions, and also we've had a very um, engaging audience asking very relevant questions. So let me quickly sum up. Uh, I absolutely loved Mr. Um, Krishna's um, speech, and I loved that he raised a um, lot of questions. And he spoke about the identity of fluidity, making us question our very question, you know, Um, and I love that he uh, made reference to the multiplicity of uh, South Asian identities, because even though we are one region, we are all very different. And um, um, he says that uh, we needed to allow for contestation um, of identity itself and to create a vibrant space that brings together people, allowing for diversity. And uh, we should celebrate um, diversity and give a space for diversity. And um, uh, next we had Mr. Ali Sethi, who um, was very, um, who brought a very emotional uh, connection and emotional tone to the conversation. He spoke about his teacher and um, how she brought poetic um, sensibility into music, which was also very important. Um, he spoke of um, uh, spoke of living um, in uh, learning to live inside a paradox. And he also um, spoke of a tonic healing alternative to the political and social tensions we live in, which is important, um, a reference to reality that we live in. And um, he, of course, spoke about um, levitating you know, beyond the realities and the geographical boundaries and the tensions that exist. Um, then we had Mr. Dr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Sarmast, um, who gave us a nice example from the Court of Mughals and how um, music unified various religions and cultures and brought peace, harmony, and stability to the region, which is um, an important thing to remember and to keep in mind that music has the ability to um, uh, help maintain peace, even when um, on the outside everyone seems to be fighting and only see differences. Then uh, we had Mr. Neil, 
who spoke about something very different. He's um, uh, the influence Western music has had on himself personally. And uh, he brought in examples from his musical journey and how he has innovated what is traditionally considered Western and how he has infused um, the Christmas um, songs, for example, with um, colors and themes uh, from an Eastern color palette. Um, and finally, we, we had Mr. Vidyapati. Um, I loved his performance. I think he's the only one who actually performed uh, at this discussion and it really elevated our spirits and um, infused us um, you know, with beautiful harmonies, which was um, really enjoyable to me personally. Um, and I felt that your presentation perfectly demonstrated the commonalities in music because you could hear it. Uh, we can talk about the commonalities, but when you actually hear it, you know, oh, um, you know, yes, Sri Lankan music um, has tones from uh, other uh, parts of um, South Asia. So um, it's been an absolute pleasure to um, listen to all the speakers and I loved um, the final notes of um, Mr. Krishna, who said that we should um, debaggage before listening. I think that's a lesson that we could all take away with because whatever kind of music we are exposed to, um, you know, whatever the future holds, I think if this um, talk um, has given me something, it's to be open um, before we embrace uh, music and to go to the very elements of music. Uh, when we listen, I come from education background and my um, interest um, in this topic is how we teach um, children music and what and how and what we expose um, to the children. So instead of putting music into silos, I think it's important um, for us to go to the elements and to understand what is sound and to really debaggage so that we don't have this, um, you know, cultural labels and boxes and silos and we are more open to um, diversity. Uh, perhaps it can help dissipate the tensions in the region and music can really transform and transport us um, to a different dimension. So um, and now I would like to um, take this opportunity to deliver the vote of thanks. It is my absolute honor and privilege to acknowledge the contribution of a few people who have worked very hard to make this webinar um, a success. We wish to extend our sincere appreciation to all the speakers for their valuable time and for contributing to such a rich discussion. Thank you for your enthusiasm and energy. Our thanks to the energetic and multi-talented Mrs. Soundari Ro David Rodrigo from Sri Lanka for her enthusiasm and support in making this event a resounding success. We thank her for believing in the potential of this idea and for joining forces with the brilliant Ambassador Rao and to me and for making this event a reality. We are grateful to Aditi Bharati for doing a fabulous job behind the scenes overseeing all the marketing efforts of the event and making sure everything goes smoothly. Finally, we are indebted to Ambassador Nirupama Rao for being the live wire behind this event and for doing a fabulous job with the planning and the execution of this event. Her experience, expertise, and international profile has made it possible to garner the attention of so many people from far and wide and has drawn such a diverse audience to this important and exciting discussion. I have no doubt that this marks just the beginning of an auspicious journey ahead. Perhaps this could be, as one of the members of the audience rightly said, the start of a golden era for South Asian music. Thank you and have a nice evening.